Hello, and welcome back. This is gonna be part four. Okay, guys, uh, okay. This is getting exciting. Cult, Jesus, their cults are upon us. Day of Ascension has arrived. It is Saturday, February 2nd. And, uh, happy birthday to me, because in a few days it'll be my birthday, and Jesus, their cults are out. The floodgates have opened. We are getting leaks galore. People have gotten their books already. I have not. I had to be a plebeian and wait for my book. I pre-ordered it today, getting the uh, collector's edition, not the limited edition. Sorry, 200 bucks, 250 bucks, just, a, just too much for my budget. I really wanted it, but just not enough. But you might see all around. Uh, I got some images in the background for this because I do not have the book. I've just been watching what others have uh, been showing. Uh, the thank you to Bell of Lost Souls for the images here that I've uh, greedily, greedily stolen uh, just from your video. Um, these are kind of the clearest of just all the rules that we can see. Uh, but I'm going to be using them as sort of uh, just a template because all I want to talk about, I'm not going to go over units until I get the book myself. Uh, just some things that I see uh, <clears throat> currently, and we're going to tackle Unquestioning Loyalty, uh, Cold Ambush, Brood Brothers, and the Psychic Table uh, that we now have. Uh, we've seen a lot of stratagems, but I think we need to see the units uh, be in tandem with the stratagems to really understand. While these uh, four things, the Unquestioning Loyalty, Cold Ambush, Brood Brothers, and the Psychic Table, we can kind of view on its own and just kind of evaluate <clears throat> how our uh, armies are going to change. So first off, I'm going to talk about unquestioning loyalty. This one's going to be the briefest and quickest of them all because it is honestly the one that's changed the least. Um, there are some interesting ideas here, though. Uh, first off is it is uh, protecting your cult characters, and but both, both, both the cult infantry and brood brothers infantry can on a four up take wounds for uh your characters now keep in mind also this is not a mortal wound like all other rules are kind of similarly worded this is just a model slain so you're going to want your cheapo one wound infantry doing the jumping in front of the guys uh the brood brothers one is interesting because uh later when i talk about brood brothers this does allow you to take a 30 man conscript unit and then potentially with another Warlord trait, have a two-up Protect the Warlord of Questioning Loyalty with 30 models. So now all of a sudden you got 30 Ablative Wounds on your Warlord. Uh, pretty good. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's basically it for a Questioning Loyalty. Uh, this cannot be used to protect your Brood Brothers characters. It does specify cult characters, so keep that in mind. Um, but it's still really cool. Um, it's a nice way because I think our characters are going to be very key in our army, so we got to protect them as much as we can. Uh, now, moving on to Cult Ambush, this is the interesting one. We've uh, known about how it works. We know that there's two modes. There's Underground, where it's essentially the Deep Striking, where you are off the table, and you will come uh, later, nine inches away from the enemy. Uh, this does follow the normal deployment rules, so you have to, if you're coming in through Underground, turn one, you have to be in your own deployment zone. If you are going to try and go out, you have to wait till turn two, etc. Now, one thing I want to keep in mind with that is because there's a way to go back underground, uh, multiple ways. There's the drill, there's a stratagem, uh, Return to Shadows, that has returned, confirmed. Um, but um, people were saying, well, you, it's useless after turn three. There was an FAQ that said if you were on the table uh, and then got back into reserves and it was past turn three, they are not destroyed. They have to at least be on the table first. And then they are okay. Obviously, when the game ends, then they are considered destroyed if they are out there. So by turn five, you got to make sure everyone's back, but at the minimum. But don't think that by turn three, this rule becomes useless, or after turn three. So there's the underground part, and then there's the blips part, the ambush part. Uh, very big things with the blips. Uh, there is a sentence uh, that is on the second page of the blip rules. Uh, First column, second paragraph, it's like the second sentence. <coughs> Whenever you measure uh, to or from the uh, blip, you are measuring from the center. It's like an objective marker. And uh, you want to make sure uh, 
you are doing that properly. Don't measure from the edge. So that means that you can kind of make your own blips, and as long as they are you know reasonably sized, you're measuring from the center anyway. So because um, the big part is when you reveal the unit, you are within an inch of the center of the blip. So just to make it easier on yourself, make sure your blip's smaller than an inch diameter. Inch radius. Yes. Yes. Inch radius. Math. Math facts. Math fact of the day. I am a math um, anyway, so that's a big part, measure from the center. Uh, this does add some interesting things, though, because um, when you set up your blips, you must be wholly within your own deployment zone, um, which means that the edge of the blip does count, but I think because you measure from the center, you can have the center of it up to the 12-inch mark or whatever mark of the deployment. That's the only way that makes sense to me um, because um, of how everything else is measured. So hopefully that's FAQ'd. Um, I'm planning to kind of work through my opponents that way because, in all honesty, when you reveal the blip, uh, they must be set up within your own deployment zone anyway. So there's no fudging of like, oh, I got a little bit of an extra inch here or there. It's like, no, you're still going to be set up within your own deployment zone. And the 9-inch uh, keep away from me rule that prevents your opponent from moving with a blip there of nine inches away, you're measuring from the center again. So I would think that that would just make sense that you could put the center of your objective or your ambush marker on the edge of your deployment. And that would be considered wholly within. Um, please, GW, FAQ that because then um, that would make things just easier rules wise. Um, still, this is a very powerful rule. Um, with now we know what kind of Nexos does and what other. Stratagems do with the blips. This just lets you counter deploy for days. No matter what your opponent does, you're going to be able to out deploy them. Uh, sorry, Charlie. So um, that is Cult Ambush. Now I want to go over to uh, Brood Brothers. Excuse me, I'm going to get to my own picture here. There we go. Brood Brothers. This is a big deal. Um, or I should go to Cult Creed and some other things. This is a big page. Um, if you got the one that says insurrection, I got those three pages flying by. So, <clears throat> but insurrection on this page, there's a lot of rules here. First and foremost is you get the insurrectionist. This is the objective secured. Yay. Everyone gets that. Um, <clears throat> no special version. It's just our troops, um, that get this. So nothing crazy going on there. Um, the bit on the side, I missed this the first few times. It took me a while to find this because people were saying, well, you can only take one character per detachment. And I was like, where is it saying this? Uh, it's right here on this page. So match play rules. If you're using a Battleforged army, uh, you play following those rules. Cool. Uh, you have the gene sect. Gosh, that word. You can include each gene to the character only once in the same detachment. An example, uh, detachment could only include one Patriarch and one Magus. Uh, that's a little annoying. Um, <coughs> really limits the double Magus, double Abominant things that I have. I got quite a lot of Broodlord slash Patriarch models. Um, I think this is a little annoying. This just forces you to take multiple detachments, which in all honesty is probably what's going to happen with the army anyway. Um, we're going to be very Stratagems uh, heavy, and so command points are going to be huge. So it's just kind of annoying. It limits your list building ability um, how you kind of want it, but it is very thematic where really through the gene cycles of the cult, only one patriarch exists, only one magus exists, only one primus exists. So good on you, GW. You made that lore choice. Um, but then you have the brood father. This one might get people upset, but if your army includes any patriarchs, that he must be the warlord. Um, so take that how you will. <coughs> I think that's not a, there's some stratagems that help alleviate this, but um, take that how you will. The it does stipulate that uh, other GC or cult or brew brother characters cannot be your warlord. I will say when I segue into brew brothers, the rule right now, no brew brother can be a warlord. Period. End of story. Um, so this also includes the fact that in the brew brothers detachment. We can no longer take relics, and we can no, and we can obviously not have a warlord, so no warlord traits. 
So gone are the days of uh, taking a company commander with the Onager Array, no, not the Onager Array, the Kirov's Aquila and the Grand Strategist um, Warlord trait to be able to on five steel objectives and recover, or steel command points and recover command points. That's gone. Um, I think that is okay. It makes sense. Um, they've definitely gone with the thematic version of this game, of this codex, and the fact that you could have say, oh yeah, that company commander's a warlord, even though you have a patriarch running around somewhere else on the table, doesn't quite make lore sense, right? <coughs> but there's some interesting additions with Brood Brothers. Before I jump in, I'm going to talk about the Cold Creeds real quick. We know what they are. Um, we saw them all displayed. We know all their exact wordings and everything from the GW sh uh, showcasing. And I had a video about that. That is part two. If you haven't seen those yet, go check it out. They are also on the Insurrection page. Uh, if you want to pause the video at, when it shows up and just look at them over, you may. But the big part here is that Cult Creeds affect only the infantry and the bikers and exclude any Gene Stealer keyword units. So your Patriarchs and your Pure Strain Gene Stealers will not get the benefits of the Cult, <coughs> excuse me, of the Cult Creeds. This is rather unfortunate again. I mean, they give you the lore reason that the Cult Creed is more of the human construct. Um, that it's, you know, the humans are the ones kind of creating this, but the gene stealers and the patriarch themselves are purely alien, and so they really don't follow the cult creed. Makes sense. Um, it's just kind of, it's just kind of sad where it's like, no, my strength five plus two advanced gene stealers are gone. But <coughs> keep in mind, everything else can be taken by patriarchs and gene stealers, and there's, there's things that can affect them. They're not completely cornered off from being affected by the cult's rules. Um, but just keep that in mind. Specifically, the cult creeds, your gene stealers, and your patriarch are not included in that. Um, now we can finally get to Brood Brothers, which is interesting. I got my Astro Terran book here for some quick referencing. But um, <coughs> they have really expanded this rule, but they have given us some surprising things, in my opinion. I keep moving my screen. I need to not do that. Um... So to start off with, they say, you know, there are several Brew Brothers uh, units in the book. And these are like your Cult Lehman Russes, the Heavy Weapons Teams. The, there's a Brew Brother Infantry Squad, which is pretty much the Guardsman Infantry Squad. And when you take them, they do not exclude you from the Cult Creed. They just kind of do their own thing. But they're a nice cheap choice uh, trying to fill out brigades or battalions and such like that. Uh, in addition, this is the juicy part, though. Um, you can include an Astromero Terram unit in a G Sewer Colts uh, army in the same match play game, so the detachment is still with us. Uh, you ignore the Astromero Terram keywords when you're choosing the faction. So you can still faction in Tyranid Detachment, G Sewer Cult Detachment, with their Brood Brothers, because you're just ignoring Astromero Terram completely. You can have Tyranids as your overall faction with one of each. Or more, uh, if you can fit it. <coughs> and I think that would actually be probably a more powerful one. And there's a combo I've uh, thought of that is kind of terrifying. And we'll talk about that would involve all three working together. That could destroy a knight. little preview for you right there. In one go. Uh, if your army is battleforged to continue reading, you may all, only include one astronomical terror detachment uh, for each unit that has the Astro Militarum keyword in your army for each g Sir cult detachment in that army. This is important. This means that, um, <coughs> because there's a ton of sub-factions in here um, that have the Astro Militarum keyword, but then they're like Officio, uh, Ministorum, or um, things like uh, the Commissar. Uh, he is, so for example, he's Officio Perfectoris. Um, Things like that. There's a lot of uh, aeronautica for the Valkyrie and such. There's a lot of sub-factions, but all you care about is Astro Militarum, which they all have. Um, so that's important for later. You cannot include Astro Militarum named characters, of course. Um, 
<coughs> it would be interesting if they had uh, except this guy because it's like, oh, he's a secret gene stealer. That would have been hilarious, but eh, maybe later, GW. Maybe later. Um, let's see. I read that part already. Uh, these astromilitarum detachments are then known as Brood Brother detachments, and every unit that has the regiment or Mentellum Tempestus keyword must replace in every instance on its data sheet with Brood Brothers. If a unit does not have any of these keywords, it simply gains the Brood Brothers keyword. Okay. First and foremost, you'll notice the Militarum Tempestus is specifically mentioned. Gisir Cult can still take Militarum Tempestus units, like the Skions and the Tempestor Prime. And uh, the big one is the Torox Prime. You can take those. And a big part of that is you are replacing every instance of those words uh, where it says Militarum Tempestus Ordered Regiment with Brood Brother. If you read the Torox Prime one, it says it can only transport 10 Militarum Tempestus units. Well, that's a keyword right there. So we can take Torox Primes and put regular old guardsmen in them. Because they'll be all Brood Brothers. All the Brood Brothers will be the same. Uh, it's an interesting one. I mean, the Torox is a much better transport than the regular Torox. And potentially even the Chimera, potentially even the, the Goliath truck. And so if we're going to bring any sort of thing, I find that I found that interesting. You could also have a regular company commander give orders to the... Um, na, 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 na. Nope, I went too far. The Mount Tempestus Skions, because they will both have Brood Brother keyword. Um, and this infects everything. I mean, anytime there's regiment or any sort of keyword for Militarum Tempestus, you're putting in Brood Brother. Um, there, that makes some interesting cross-effecting going on. I think it's going to take a while to dissect on how all that is going to play out. Now the next part in that last sentence to kind of uh, round this out is uh, if a unit does not have either of these keywords, it simply gains the Brood Brothers keyword. <coughs> okay, okay, okay. So the most interesting thing I found initially is um, there's this nifty little unit called Crusaders in this uh, in the Astro Militarum book. They have Astro Militarum as their keyword. So you can take them into Brood Brothers attachment. They gain Brood Brothers, and now all of a sudden you can give them orders. Because in the Astro Militarum book, you can't. They don't have regiment keywords. But they do in Gene Cult. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, I have not been able to dissect Crusaders very much. I know that they probably got an update um, with the Sisters of Battle one, so i got to look through that. But, I mean, um, things that are outside the purview of purely Astro Militarum, such as Commissars, uh, gain Brood Brother. You can order a Commissar around. I don't know how effective that would be, but just that alone makes for some interesting potential rule bleeding, bleed throughs between units that um, maybe DW didn't intend, maybe they do. Um, it's all very interesting. It, it'll be very interesting to see. Uh, you can order the, um, uh, where'd he go? I think it, like the officer of the fleet or the uh, ordnance guy to re-roll his big air raid or the orbital bombardment he gives, um, stuff like that. Um, you can order Orgrins and around, um, give them bonuses that they normally cannot give Rattlings. With all our snipers in our unit, you get a big old 10-minute blob of Rattlings, and you can give them uh, Fire on My Target. That's the, no, that's the special one. You can give them Take Aim, so they're re-rolling their ones to hit. Uh, interesting. Uh, that one sentence, that one paragraph, I was like, it was, my mind was blown. I was like, wait a minute. Um, that's some interesting things. I'm going to bring the book back in a minute. Just to finish this, um, <coughs> uh, Brood Brothers attachments do not gain um, any of the codex to the disciplines. That's fine. Um, that's what was before. Um, they also, uh, where did it go? Uh, they don't gain any of the special, the regiment-specific stratagems, orders, so you get the generic stratagems and orders. You do not get the regiment-specific ones. Furthermore, infantry models uh, in Brood Brothers attachments uh, increase their leadership by one. Uh, leadership 10 commissars, anyone? 
uh, yes, please. If uh, th that's a nice little bonus, and they also gain unquestioning loyalty, like I was talking about earlier, where you can have uh, a thirty-man conscript unit right next to your broodlord patriarch, and uh, he's the warlord. <coughs> And all of a sudden, you're shrugging off hits on the him on, on a two-up. Uh, it's, it's amazing. Um, units in Brewers Attachment do not gain the cult ambush, so you're not ambushing anybody. Um, and there's no way. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I need to get a drink of water or something. But we're almost done, I think. Um, but they uh, there's no way to give them cult ambush with a stratagem or anything. So no ambushing a big Bane Blade tank sadly, but yeah, it makes sense. Um, do not give any relics, as I was saying earlier, no. and the command benefits of the detachments in your army are halved, rounding up. This reflects that, you know, is that the primary force are kind of just acquisition, they're kind of stolen. Uh, this is <coughs> a big deal. It's not as bad as what rumors were that we were not going to get any command benefits. Um, but half rounding up is still not bad. I mean, a battalion would be three like it was at release. Um, a brigade would be five. So uh, it's not bad. Um, it's not good either. But the big one would be if you're taking the smaller ones, like, say, the Outrider, the Spearhead, because when you half the one bonus, it becomes half, and you round up again. So it's just the same exact bonus. The big ones are going to be the battalion and the brigade. Um, and you're going to want to probably take... Tyranid and Gseer cult brigades and battalions anyway, and you could use the Brood Brothers to be much more surgical in uh, the units you're bringing uh, to fill out roles in the army. Um, and so brigades and battalions aren't necessarily the best for that. <coughs> but if you had the points, you know, <coughs> you could at least get three command points out of them, or five. Um, so could have been worse, um, could be better, but I mean, I think that would still be very powerful. Uh, next and last, we'll talk about the brood mind discipline. Hands down, I'll say it right now, no doubt in my mind, best psychic discipline in the game. Um, every one of these spells is fantastic. Uh, Psionic Blast being the only eh one, but it is a second smite. And second smites, as this is I'm playing uh, Tyranids, um, for what I know from Psychic Scream, a second smite is never a bad thing. Um, it is it's slightly worse, but I mean it's just, it's mortal wounds. It's not bad. This is the best, and everything else is out of this world fantastic. Um, so <clears throat> big ones, uh, mass hypnosis. We'll start from the beginning. Uh, this one is identical from the index. You are manifesting on a seven. You are targeting an enemy. They cannot fire Overwatch. They fight last, and they have minus one to hit. Any just one of those effects on one spell is amazing, but all three are on one spell for just seven. And there is a relic that Gene Seer Cults can bring that gives you a plus one to your uh, psychic ability. Also keep in mind, if you're ally in Tyranids, these two occults have the Tyranid keyword, so they are not affected by Shadow and the Warp for their psychic abilities. So you don't need to worry about that. Um, fantastic. Love Mass Hypnosis. Mind Control. This one's going to uh, drive people nuts. I do believe uh, Mind Control uh, has gone up from... It was a 7, and uh, it is a 7 currently. It used to be a 6. Yes, so it was slightly nerfed, but hey, you know what? All's fair. It is still an amazing ability because its functionality is still the same. You are 12 inches away. You roll 3d6. If you beat their leadership, uh, well, if you lose, if it says if you don't beat their leadership, nothing happens. But if you tie or beat it, you get to shoot with them. Um, I had a game where I might control a Bane Blade for three turns in a row. It was disgusting. And with the big knights running around, the Castellans. You and you with the guaranteed ability to cult in, uh, ambush in a magus um, nine inches away, which is within the twelve inch bubble. Uh, you're going to be mind controlling rather easily, and there's a lot of abilities in this book to reduce leadership, so that way you can make that roll easier. Wonderful. Uh, you can also make one single close combat attack, but 
uh, it's that's still the garbage part of the ability. You want to shoot with it. You want to take something and shoot with it. A psionic blast. I mentioned it before. It's a slightly worse smite. You're uh, facing off against leadership again. You roll two d six this time. If you're higher, or as well, if you're lower than their leadership, they just suffer one mortal wound. Otherwise, it's d three. So. <coughs> If you beat their leadership, yay, it's a smite. Uh, if you don't, it's just one mortal wound. Eh, okay. I mean, it's best, best of a five. It's an additional mortal wound. I would not complain. It's also, um, if manifested, it's more surgical because it does not target the closest enemy. Uh, if manifested, select an enemy unit within 18 and visible. It does not need to be the closest, so that could be useful. Uh, mental Onslaught. Uh, it's a little hard to read, just real quickly make sure I know which one I'm talking about. Okay, um, we're actually going to, I'm going to circle back to this one last. This one's the exciting one. Okay, going going to five, we'll come back to Mental Onslaught. Psychic so Stimulus, uh, cast of a six. If uh, you select a friendly Jesus or Cult unit with an 18, uh, start of your next phase, that unit can charge, you advanced, unless it fell back, and they always fight first. Uh, even if they didn't charge. Wonderful ability. Um, it's even a better version of the Tyranid Onslaught, because Tyranid Onslaught's like that first part, and uh, but then they gain the We Fight First. Wonderful. Fantastic. And uh, really defensive, too. It's a nice defensive spell, because these cult are super flimsy, and they need to get the charge, and they need to get the first fight. And so this can guarantee you get the first fight in your turn, and you would potentially get this first fight in your opponent's turn as well. Unless they picked that unit first. Um, if I've read this right. <coughs> have charged or have a similar... Okay, so no. If if you were the charger, then you would pick first, obviously. And go first. Uh, but then your opponent, unless they counter charge something in, then your unit would just go first. Um, or at least would have to go first before the other unit did. So, really good. Uh, Might from Beyond is, is nearly identical to its previous iteration. It just now affects spikers as well as normal infantry. 18 inches, add 1 to strength and attacks. You, you can't complain. Strength 5, 5 attacks. Gene Sealers, whatever their attack, it's probably dead. Especially if it's a regular tough 4, tough 5 guy. All right, now we're going to circle back to Mental Onslaught because there's some combos here, some potential that's uh, that's uh, interesting. So it's Manifest of a 6, not very, very expensive. It's like the enemy model with an 18, so fair amount of range. Uh, each player rolls a d6 and adds each of their model's leadership characteristics to the, the dice roll. <coughs> if your sum is higher, the enemy unit suffers one mortal wound. If the uh, selected model is still alive, you repeat the process, each player rolling a d6 and adding to the leadership, and either the, uh, until the, either the model is destroyed or you fail to create the mortal wound um, by having a score higher than your opponents. Okay. So there's this lovely guy, the Patriarch. He's leadership 10 and a psyker, and he can take... The relic that gives you a plus one and do additional stuff like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, big things, though. There's ways to edit leadership in this book. There's the locus. I'm thinking of uh, this is the uh, Blackstone Fortress guy. I think I'll just use him as a locus for now because uh, I'm currently getting some of the other characters before him. Um, but if you happen to be within six of this guy, you're a minus one leadership. Uh, there's also a way somewhere in here... I forgot where it was that you can get plus one leadership to the Patriarch, so he's leadership 11. And then what you can do is, if you're allied in with Tyranids, um, they have a spell called the Horror, which uh, makes your enemies minus one leadership and minus one hit. That's the big one. But then you have in the Astral Terran book, uh, a spell in their discipline that is the very first one I've never really taken. Um, little Terran Psychers, Terrifying Visions, and uh, that makes your uh, the target unit minus 
to leadership. And then uh, I believe that's the only one that would, yeah, that's the only one I would do. So, and also in the Tyranid one, there is a relic that uh, you can put on a monster and it makes someone minus one leadership. It's a specific fleet one, but the Yomagander one. But what you can do is, you might see where I'm going with this, you could make it, if you wanted to snipe something, like a knight, where unless they roll a six and you potentially roll a one, that they're going to take the mortal no matter what. So if as long as you roll, uh, I think someone was saying it's like uh, on a big knight, a Castellan, you could reliably get like minus three leadership on him. So he's at a six. If you're at a, um, if you're at normal 10 here, let's say with the Patriarch, uh, they would just need to roll a five up to even potentially beat you normally, but you are adding a dice to this. So if, as long as you are rolling a three up, um, because there's, unless they rolled a six and you rolled a two, then they would still take the mortal wound. I believe because uh, each you have to win the roll. Uh, if you score higher. So yeah, if you tie, then it goes away. So if you roll consistently a three up, it's going to make it. If you roll a two, they must roll a six. If you roll one, they must roll a five or higher. And if they don't, they're taking a mortal and another mortal and another mortal and another mortal. You get the idea. One spell, casting on a six, potentially a five if you took a relic, could kill anything. Period. As long as you prep them beforehand with uh, some debilitating leadership stuff. I think the big ones would be the horror from the Tyranid ones and the terrifying visions from the Astro Militarum. You would have to be careful of making, trying to make sure your Psyker wasn't in the minus one uh, Shadow and a Warp but that might not be feasible. That might just be something you have to work around. Um, but yeah, um, and you can use a command reroll to maybe that one time save your butt and keep the chain going. Uh, it's, it's a crazy combo. It's one that takes a lot of setup, maybe one that's too expensive for such a setup. Set up. Um, but it, it's, it's a hilarious idea. One spell, one, the knight's dead, from full health to nothing. Including, potentially, even the bigger Forge World Knights, where it's like, it doesn't matter how many wounds you have, it's all about your leadership. And that's on the, something that's like a leadership 9. If you have a big, <coughs> big scary target, like a Tau Riptide or something, or a Tau Storm Surge that has, like, leadership, what, 7? Uh, see if I can pull it up real quick while I'm talking. But yeah, a much lower leadership... Um, then all of a sudden it's like, well, pff, you don't even need to get all those other spells on there. You just <coughs> do that uh, one and it's just all over. It's all over for that model. And again, because we have consistently, you're nine inches away from the deep strike, uh, you don't need to worry about having to be too far away to cast the spell. You can be <coughs> exactly where you need to be when you need to be there. Um, really good. The only thing would be like the uh, in, um, <coughs> excuse me, in Codex Locus where he has the minus one leadership aura that is only six inches. Uh, there's no way to increase that um, naturally. So um, you would have to like use the stratagem to get him closer after you call ambush him in. But, you know, there's other more reliable ways with the spells. Um, so yeah, I finally got the riptide up here. Okay, leadership eight. Um, but still, um, what's the storm surge? Um, <coughs> <coughs> gosh, I hate this cough. Okay, leadership eight again. But that one, that one number is the can be a huge difference between like never making that roll or just barely making it. So um, big deal, uh, awesome spell, uh, awesome potential. I do plan to, one of these, probably one of my first games is to try and make that combo work. It's like, bring some Psychers from Master Militarum, some uh, Psychers from Tyranids, uh, do all the minus leaderships, and just be like, okay, I'm going to snipe that one guy in one turn. Hopefully it's like against a, a list as a knight or a big super heavy of some sort, because then it's just like, and dead. 
What's the leadership on a Beyblade? Okay, eight. So, okay. I mean, you can even do this onto things like flyers and stuff like that. Like just seeing here, the Valkyries leadership seven. Um, how many people are playing Valkyries? But just thinking of slightly smaller scale, you could still target something like a big tough vehicle and just shoot it and well, mine bullet it out of the sky or out of the, out of the battlefield. It's amazing. Interesting to see what happens. So. Uh, that's going to be it for this video. I'm going to be potentially doing some videos here and there that are really short. Uh, one model at a time or a couple models at a time, just talking about the rules if I can find them. Uh, I just don't have the book on me, so I don't want to comment on things that I can't directly see. Because uh, there's been some commentary that I read out there that, I'm, that I look at the book and I'm like, no, that's not what that means at all. Um, you're just misunderstanding or something like that. And I, I'm, not, I'm guilty of that. I mean, just the picture that's just up right now with the insurrection page. I took me forever to find the rules. I was like, oh, you can only have one character per detachment. Uh, or one type of character per detachment. You can have three Maguses and a Supreme Command, something like that. And I was like, what is he talking about? And then I found it. And I was like, oh, there it is. So, hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, check out my other parts if you haven't seen them please hit that like and subscribe button. And uh, I will see you all shortly. This is exciting. I'm loving what I'm seeing from the book right now. And I can't wait to get my own dirty little jeans in hands on it. You all have a good evening. This is Jesse signing out.